it gives me immense pleasure that all of you are here present on the occasion of launch of my book, Reflections on Contemporary India. I am extremely grateful to Honorable President <coughs> of India, Sri Pranam Mukherjee ji, and Speaker of Lok Sabha, Honorable Meera Kumarji, and all of you. I have no words to thank you for the wonderful response you have given to the launch of this book. My father, Dr. S. C. Dutt, a gold medalist of Calcutta University and a prominent scientist who was given the Rafi Ahmed Kidwai Award in its inception year, has always been my influence. He had told me that even if you eat a suki roti, chew it at least 32 times and it starts tasting sweet. The scientific reason is that as you chew the roti, the saliva breaks the cellulose into carbohydrate and then into glucose. The moral of this story is that in, very, in every field that we work in and in every subject that we handle, if we go deeper into, that would bring us immense satisfaction and pleasure. Let me introduce my new book, Reflections on Contemporary India. These essays are based on various addresses and lectures that I have delivered over the last few years. The audiences have been generally young adults. Contemporary India is going through multidimensional changes. The 21st century has increased the complexities of transformation. On the one hand, we have a very large agrarian society, and on the other, we seem to have moved into the age of information without fully traversing through the Industrial Revolution. This gap prevailing in the Indian society, whether in its economic aspects or social dimensions, necessitates the need of rapid yet sustainable change. This book outlines a number of developmental issues which I feel necessary for our progress. The role of management is of immense importance for our leadership. The essays express the aspiration of seeking challenges and the precept of doing what one enjoys and enjoying what one does. I have tried to ensure that each chapter contains some suggestions also. Today, we dream of India emerging as a global power. Indians are conscious of their national security and their ability to affect international security. When India became free, our founding fathers invested resources and efforts in setting up some excellent educational institutions like IITs, IIMs, NITs, Central Research Institutes on various sciences, medical and engineering colleges, agriculture research and agriculture universities, and national labs. In the 60s, we saw one of the biggest challenge namely food shortage being solved by a dedicated team of scientists and technologists who brought in the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution is something which we have, been, we have su seen succeed in our lifetime and we have seen how from a deficit country we became food surplus and now we have food security law in place. I think the Green Revolution brought tremendous confidence to us and only yesterday I heard the, the Honorable President talking about the, the second Green Revolution which has been, uh, which has taken the eastern part of India into another dimension of agriculture production. I have see, been uh, fortunate of having worked in the health department as its secretary and have found that to be a, one of my most interesting charges. My state, Chhattisgarh, is full of natural and biological resource. Its 44% area is forest, and it has approximately 12% of total national mineral available. Chhattisgarh, as well as India, is credited with a treasure of medicinal herbs. The market for herbal pro pro products is unorganized. The Ministry of Health, along with Indian Council of Medical Research, ICMR, 
Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, CSIR, decided to <coughs> compile all our traditional knowledge and its formulae in a digital form and set up a traditional knowledge digital library, TKDL in short. Now, this traditional knowledge is our heritage and only India can be the holder of this right. However, the benefit of all our tra traditional knowledge must go to the humanity and therefore the systems of Ayurveda, Siddha and Yoga as well as Yunani and Homeopathy must lead us to find new molecules and method of treatment. Our ancestors have said <coughs> and millions of, uh, at, at least two or three million millenniums ago, Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina, Sarve Santu Niramaya, Sarve Bhadrani Pashanti, Ma Kashchituk Bhar Bhagavet. Now, Sarve Santu Niramaya means that everybody should be healthy. Health is one of the most crucial objectives of a free nation. And uh, we could, if uh, able to innovate through the knowledge given by our ancestors in the, uh, our traditional systems, innovate new medicines, new modern medicines, that would be a service to humanity. Our scientists have done us immensely proud. And like always, we have been grateful to our scientists who have brought out this level of self-reliance and taught us to be rightfully a part of a bigger league in the world. I have been a part of this project on Integrated Guided Missile Development Program, which has a number of different aspects from production point of view, <coughs> Prithvi, Trishul, Nag, Akash, and then Agni. Each one of those missile has got its own features, and they are all great news for the defense of our country. Each one of these development is immensely interesting and useful. I am thankful to individuals like Dr. Homi Bhabha, who set up BARC and the entire atomic energy program, and leaders and scientists who set up ISRO. The idea of India as a tolerant, vibrant, and progressive civilization acquires great significance amidst the turbul turbulence of 21st century. The essays underscore the belief that our young people are capable of bringing about the desired change. We are a young nation. Our young pop people are not only capable of bringing about the desired change, but also increasingly getting equipped with the skills and knowledge required for enabling it. It is necessary as uh, and important to motivate them to be good leaders. Our Honorable President, Sri Prana Mukherjee, has said, and I quote, India is not just a geography, it is also a history of ideas, philosophy, intellect, industrial genius, craft, innovation, and experience. The promise of India has sometimes been mislaid by a misfortune, at other times by our own complacence and weakness. Destiny has given us another opportunity to recover what we have lost. We will have no one to blame but ourselves if we falter, unquote. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and thank the President and the Honorable Speaker. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here for the release of Reflections on Contemporary India, authored by Sri Shekhar Dajji. I congratulate him for his intellectually stimulating essays on topical issues. It is a singular honor for me to have this opportunity to be able to present this book to respected Rashtrapati ji. Rashtrapati ji is a great scholar, a voracious reader, and he has a phenomenal memory. I have known him for many, many years. And of the ble many blessings 
that I have the most important, one of the most important blessings is that I know him. And every time I come to meet him, he is kind enough to spare a great deal of time for me. And every time he speaks to me on a different subject and in so much depth, I'm amazed by his knowledge and it's always a learning experience. This publication reflects his sensitivity for the common man. Not only has he highlighted their problems, but has also proposed measures to overcome. This volume dwells upon a wide array of subjects like globalization, sustainable development and agriculture, having national and international ramifications. I often find such issues being discussed at various bilateral and multilateral fora, be it the Interparliamentary Union, or the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. Let me tell you that parliamentarians across nations and continents share similar views pertaining to the well-being of mankind. Global warming and climate change are currently agitating the entire global community. I firmly believe that sustainable development is crucial for our very survival. I have little experience to share with you, which has disturbed me a great deal. And I've been wanting to find a solution to it, but have not arrived at one so far. A few months ago, I was invited in a rural area of our country to address some school children, college children. My stage was right in front of a small hill and I saw that a part of that hill had been cut for making little, little, what we call gittis for construction work. Now, construction work cannot be stopped. But for that construction work, we are also destroying our hills and mountains. Now, what can be the alternative? I would like to know. So when we talk of sustainable development, we must find answers to this. I'd been to Slovenia a few months ago. Every time they, f they used a lot of wood for their construction, but every time they fell a tree, they plant 18 trees in its place. I'm just throwing up this idea. We have to all of us put together because we are responsible to our future generation. We have to apply ourselves and find workable solutions. So this is what this book is all about. I firmly believe that sustainable development is crucial for our very survival. She that has rightly focused upon Conservation of water resources in this book, which is our life, life, source of life. As responsible citizens, we have an obligation to safeguard our environment for our future generations. Recognizing this as the only way forward, our parliament has enacted several legislations to preserve the bounties bestowed upon us by nature. 
We are primarily an agrarian economy. Only when the farmers prosper can our people flourish. When we had the worst drought of the century in the middle of the late 60s of the last century, we, my father was the food minister, and he told me one day, that you can have the best of seeds, you can have the best of equipment for farming, you can obtain those days we used to get our tractors from Russia, the best of tractors, you can have the pesticides, the insecticides, the manure, the fertilizers, you can have the best of it, but the central to all this is the man who's going to cultivate that land. The man who is going to grow food for you. Is he happy? Is he happy? What are you going to do for that? And to even today, especially when we go to, say, my state of Bihar or the other eastern states, Bengal, Northeast, even Kashmir, where paddy is grown, you find women standing uh, in nine inches of water, nine inches of water, and they're bending at nine, more than 90 degrees, and bending like that for five to seven hours non-stop, even today, and cultivating, transplanting paddy. So we have to think of that. So I have immense admiration for our cultivators whose relentless hard work has transformed us from a food deficient country to a food surplus nation. We must now shift from resource exploitative agriculture to regenerative agriculture aimed at preventing soil erosion and land degradation. For this, we must invest in research and development of new technologies. Shri Shekhar Dajji's analysis of globalization and its impact on India compels one to introspect about our ability to keep pace with the rapid economic changes. All of us have witnessed the giant strides taken by our economy over the years. Each segment of our society has contributed to it. It is these unsung heroes, be it the laborers sweating in the blazing sun or the farmers toiling in their fields or the women striving in adverse circumstances who have spurred us on the path of progress and yet they remain bereft of its benefits. It is our onerous duty to ensure that the fruits of development reach the poorest and the weakest person. All of us have to crusade for inclusive development. I am confident that we can achieve our objective of establishing an egalitarian social order through our resolve, sincerity, and dedication. As one goes through the book, one finds an interesting transition from the physical and material to the spiritual and philosophical. And if you didn't do that, Sheikh Adadji, I, I would think that the book would be incomplete. So thank you for adding that dimension to it. The discourse on neotic science that has resemblance to our ancient tradition of the significance of mind over matter makes stirring reading. I'm convinced that the answers to many of our dilemmas lie within us. I have no doubt that India as a progressive civilization with its values of pluralism, and we are fond of saying the, using the word tolerance, but I would get, go a step ahead and we, I would say that we just don't tolerate each other's religion. We respect in our society each other's religion. That we can play a pivotal role in the 21st century. I compliment Sheikh Haddadji 
for his thought-provoking ideas and eloquent narration. I have two requests to make. I hope you would concede to it. He was participating. He was directly in the field in 1971 war. I and we would all request you to write your experiences of that war. And I have seen some very, very important photographs that you yourself have taken and your friends have taken of that uh, war. Sometimes, and I offer a Speaker of Parliament facilities that are available in the Parliament. Please hold a fo photo exhibition for everyone. These are the two requests I want to make. So, I wish you many more years of continued good health to you and also to Mrs. Dutt. Good health, happiness, and fulfillment. The remarkable thing about this book is, which I must mention, that the cover page of the book has been designed by a six-year-old child, and the back page has also been designed by, I think, approximately a child of that, that age. And both are Sheikh Haddadji's grandchildren. So, uh, I'm greatly honored in presenting the first copy of this publication to Honorable Rashpati Ji. On this very pleasant occasion, when a new book is being released, and I have the privilege of receiving the first copy. I have close acquaintance with the author of the book, Sri Shekhar Dad, who is a very distinguished civil servant and also currently serving as the governor of a very important state, Chhattisgarh. When I was Defence Minister, I had the privilege of working with him both as Secretary of Defence Production and subsequently as Defence Secretary. And I was really surprised when I say surprised, I mean it, by his profound knowledge about the security requirement the deficiencies and how to rectify those deficiencies. His ideas were always beneficial to me and he served even after I was shifted from that ministry to others under the new Minister of Defence. We are still currently carrying on C.A.K. Antony. He is fully aware of the fact that security does not relate merely the securing the border from the aggression of the external forces. He meant security requires internal peace and tranquility, harmonization, reduction of the tension arising from various social relations, correlations, actions, interactions, energy security, food security, the very comprehensive ideas of the security and some of his ideas got reflected in the various articles and chapters of the book which he has written. He had the unique privilege of serving a state and to be the governor, constitutional head of a part of that state as an IS officer. 
he was a Madhya Pradesh cadre officer and when he served Madhya Pradesh it was an integrated state including Chhattisgarh and thereafter he had the opportunity of serving the state as constitutional head governor. I had the privilege of having interaction with him on number of occasions about the problems of the state, problems of left-wing security problems, left-wing extremist activities in that state, the problems of socio-economic development. And he truly identified that unless the socio-economic issues are adequately addressed, mere enforcement of force and application of the penal laws are not going to resolve the problem. There is a serious feeling of alienation amongst the tribals. That sense of alienation from the mainstream activities are to be breached by conscious efforts and providing the necessary healing touch. He was a management expert and the discipline which he gathered from his early career as an officer of the armed commissioned officer of an armed forces. He thought it necessary, absolutely imperative to have discipline in any organization if it is to be managed and run smoothly. And in the very complex administrative setup, he has tried his best and succeeded to a considerable extent in enforcing that discipline which leads to the consistency of thinking getting reflected in action. In fact, I was deeply impressed by his aid and advice when I was minister in the ministry which he served as secretary. And thereafter as president when I am having interaction with him as governor, whenever he comes to Delhi, I have the opportunity of meeting him. I have visited <coughs> the state number of times, not number of times, I think couple of times during his period as governor and I had the privilege of being hosted by him and his gracious wife in the Raj Bhavan to discuss various issues not only related to the problems of Chhattisgarh but national problems. And I find, I could not read deeply, which I should do, but when I glance through the book, the advanced copy which I got, I find many of these reflections, many of these ideas got reflected in his writings. On another occasion, <coughs> I said that many of us read, most of us usually read, Many of us think and conceptualize our ideas, but very few of us pin down those ideas into book for the benefit of others. Here I find one of such very distinguished colleague of me, Jashwan Singh Ji, former defense minister, foreign minister, finance minister who has penned down his ideas in a number of books which are very valuable and Mr. Shekhar Das, a distinguished civil servant who has penned down his ideas in his books which will be of immense help. There was a time when the writings of our civil servants, especially in the older days and even in the earlier days, the formation of the states, the various civil servants, retired officers who penned down their experiences, their ideas, those speak of how the Indian state 
before the independence and after independence how it has taken shape nobody can deny the great contribution our civil servants made in building up us as a state as a nation i do hope that this book will be of benefit to the readers will provide important source materials to the researchers and those who will like to pursue further studies i wish the book become popular to the readers to the students to the scholars especially to the new civil service entrants in the civil service who will find quite interesting in this book i wish him good life long life healthy life and more productions like this thank you ladies and gentlemen jai hind i would like to express my profound sense of gratitude to the honorable president for graciously accepting the first copy of reflections on contemporary india my heartfelt thanks to honorable lok sabha speaker for having agreed to launch the book to you ladies and gentlemen we are obliged in honoring us by responding to our invitation needless to say we are extremely grateful to shri shekhar dat for having given us the opportunity to publish the book i would be failing in my duty if i was not to place on record our appreciation to the officers and staff of rashtrapati bhavan for their unstinted cooperation thank you jai hind